I'm going to make that in the middle of this. This is really a way of giving you a space to think about those ideas while also pursuing something else. So here we are. I'm going to um, share this uh, presentation and hope it works all right. Uh, okay. I've tried to share that. There it goes. Okay. And I will now try to do uh, a slideshow. I don't know if that's going to work. Uh, yeah. So see, see how we go with this. I'm hoping this is going to work now. Okay, so that's one of the, I put up two of the pictures that uh, are discussed in the book, but I'm going to focus a bit on a slightly different issue, which is to say, oh, it's not working. Um, uh, there we are. Phenomenological arguments in the philosophy of representation. Now, there are a bunch of places where people use phenomenological arguments in the philosophy of representation, and they seem to be always not very far away. Here's a famous one, Gombrich using Kenneth Clark. He says, a master of introspection, Kenneth Clark has recently described to us most vividly how even he was defeated when he attempted to stalk an illusion. Looking at a great Velasquez, he wanted to observe what went on when the brushstrokes and dabs of pigment on the canvas transformed themselves into a vision of transfigured reality as he stepped back. But try as he might, stepping backward and forward, he could never hold both visions at the same time. And therefore, the answer to his problem of how it was done always seemed to elude him. So that's Gombrich. And of course, Volheim, who um, uh, appeals to the idea of two twofoldness, first of all, he says, because it tells us what is experientially different about, for example, seeing Henry VIII in Holbein's portrait as opposed to seeing him face to face. And later on, he says that uh, twofoldness is at least the best explanation of the fact that under changes of viewing point, the image remains remarkably free of defamation. Bart begins his uh, camera at Lucida with uh, uh, looking at a photograph of one of Napoleon's relatives. I forget exactly which relative uh, with the words, I am looking at eyes that looked at the emperor. That's a, a kind of transparency intuition expressed there. Radford, talking about the paradox of fiction, said, we shed real tears for Mercutio. They're not crocodile tears. They are dragged from us, and they're not the sort of tears that are produced by cigarette smoke in the theater. There's a lump in our throats, and it's not the sort of lump that is produced by swallowing a fish bone. Kivin, giving a, a different and recent account of um, fiction, story fiction anyway. He says, we hear stories in the head the way Beethoven, when he read scores of Handel, heard musical performances in the head. Now, I'm now going to go through a couple of places where I deploy phenomenological arguments in the book, Real Likenesses. I, I do it at two points at least um, in the overall argument. These two points appear again and again, as it happens throughout the book, but nevertheless. The first is in connection with a paradox, which I think, at least an apparent paradox, I don't know whether it's only a paradox if it's difficult to solve, um, which I think arises for every representational art form. Suppose there's a face in a painting, photograph, or descriptive passage in a novel. I suppose that's what you're, you're, you're encountering. Attending to it, it seems we can say, both that's a face and that's not a real face and that's a face and that's worked in the medium of the art form it's painted or it's just words or whatever it might be now i thought that this paradox exposed um a problem for the principal theories i thought there were of um representation in at least three art forms um, and I thought that the, the problem it exposed in the first instance was that they were phenomenologically unnatural. Uh, in the case of paintings, for example, Gombrich, Volheim and Walton produce implausible divided accounts of our experience of representational paintings. I think that's 
Rob Hopkins term, but maybe it's everyone's. Traditional resemblance theories, like Rob's, avoid that division, but I think at the cost of denying that we see a face when we look at a portrait. I think similar problems in the end arise for transparency theories of photographs and imagination theories of novels, although there are other complexities in those two cases. Now, I think the clue is to be seen in the structure of the paradox and the fact that it presents itself as a contradiction, which is not to say that I think there is any contradiction there. If you look at that again, I think you're bound to give a phenomenologically implausible account of artistic representation if you deny that either of those two clauses, one and two for each of them, is true, or deny or think that that refers to different things in each of clause one and clause two of both, or think that the two clauses are contradictory. And all of the, the famous accounts do that. So that was one kind of phenomenological, phenomenological argument I appealed to. Okay, I said effectively you'll get uh, an unnatural phenomenology if you um, if you uh, do uh, do any of these things, and uh, that that applies in some way for all the three art forms I was concerned with. I backed that up with an argument, or at least appeal to a principle that looks as if it's not resting on phenomenological argument at first glance, but I think on reflection. Perhaps it is. Uh, I tried to back up those arguments by appeal to a principle that I called the non distraction thesis, which was this attending to the medium of an artistic representation cannot inevitably be a distraction from attending to its content or vice versa. And I take the medium here to be what the artist deliberately manipulates, it's the sort of thing that the artist is deliberately concerned with. And I take the content although this may be an unhelpful term, but for the moment, go with it, to be what you can, to use the phrase informally, see in a painting. For example, it might be a face or a tree, a house, or that someone is holding a child or whatever. Okay. Now, uh, what this means is uh, that, that actually, this actually puts uh, pressure on certain sorts of things, okay? It seems to mean if, if attending to the content were inevitably a distraction from attending to the medium or vice versa, it would be impossible for the same person to attend properly to both at the same time. And that means that in order to attend to both, it looks as if we'd have to do one of three things. Either we need to switch from attending to one to attending to the other, called a switching theory, or we need to divide the person or the in some way so that different parts of them attend to each of them at the same time, perhaps, but the two different parts are never combined. I call that squinting. Or somehow or other maintain simultaneously some impoverished attention to both content and medium, as one might hear through scratch glass to see something on the other side, for example. So we'll call that peering. Now, I think anybody whose theory takes our represent, experience of representations to involve switching, squinting, or peering, as just explained, must find it hard to explain these three things. How an artist can actually compose a work, if you think in enough detail about what the painter must actually be doing when they're painting. How one can look critically at a work to see how its subject is rendered, how a face is painted, and so on. And thirdly, how one could like the way the subject is rendered, for example, how the face is painted. And my claim is that this applies at least to the three form art forms I talked about, that's painting, photographs, and novels, but I, I, I kind of want it to be true for all art forms as well. Now, that was the claim, is that these these are very hard to make sense of uh, uh, on these activities are very hard to make sense of on switching, switching, squinting and peering theories. But it's very hard to say that those theories make those activities impossible. They just make them seem incredibly unnatural. 
So in the end, although it looks like it's a different kind of argument, I think this is another kind of phenomenological argument. And it's one that Volheim saw coming, I think, he says famously, that the artist, the artist constantly seeks an ever more intimate rapport between the two experiences of the object, what I'm calling the content, and of the medium. But how exactly, how this is to be described is a challenge to phenomenological, from phenomena, phenomenological acuity, which I cannot think how to meet, he says. And I think that means he can see his theories in trouble. Well, I think an interesting question is here, why are we led to or are particularly attracted by phenomenological arguments? Well, one thought might be that the, the point of representational art is just to produce in its viewer or hearer or reader, uh, whatever, a certain kind of experience. That, that might be one theory. That seems to me not quite right. I don't really want to explore quite why here. Although I do think that the experience of viewing, hearing, and reading the work is certainly important, must be, to whatever it is that the work does. So I think maybe we might try focusing on getting out of it another way. Um, and, and I think it's worth thinking about the fact of disagreement. People deny that their, exp their experience has the character that it's claimed that experience of works of art has, okay? So you get these phenomenological descriptions of the experience of looking at a certain painting or uh, looking at a photograph or reading a novel or whatever it is. And you will find people who say, it's not like that for me. So presumably Volheim thinks that what Gombrich says that Clark thinks is the way it is, Volheim presumably thinks that's wrong. That's not how he experiences. But rejecting Volheim in on looking at a picture presumably thinks that Volheim gets the experience wrong. It can't be like that. It must, in fact, be switching after all. Um, okay. And I've obviously I, I I've given talks about this sort of stuff, and I've heard people say that uh, they can't simultaneously see the painted surface surface and the subject of the painting so they can't see both the painted surface and the face uh, that's there uh, and obviously i've heard people say that that when they read a novel uh, it they don't hear the story in their, their head it's not not like as it were performing a kind of narrative although other people say it is exactly like that so you've got the fact of disagreement. And then the, this, this problem is, what do you do with this? If you if you think that you've got uh, phenomenological arguments and somehow it's really important to get the experience right, what do you do with the fact that people seem to disagree about it? Um, well, there's one bold route, and that's suggested by Gombrich's, Gombrich's description of Clark as a master of introspection. Uh, this is that to, to suggest that... Uh, Anybody who don't, who thinks they don't experience paintings or whatever uh, in that way, they're just not being attentive, attentive enough to their own experience. If they thought more clearly about their own experience, they would realize that it is indeed as whoever it is says it is. OK, now, I do think that is sometimes a tempting line. So I, I, for example, simply cannot believe that Clark has got his own description of his own experience right i simply can't believe that but uh i it's a dangerous one to run in general it's not the way you, you'd want to get so i think there is a better way and this is to introduce some value or norm and this is dangerous in other ways of course but I, I hope i'll be able to negotiate my way through that and well enough i think we need to claim something like that to experience a painting or novel or whatever it is like this in whatever way you're describing in your phenomenological description is to experience it properly that is to say in some way as it should be uh, experienced or as it's appropriate for it to be experienced and people who uh, whose account of uh, works makes it inevitable that they can't be experienced like that there must be something wrong with their account okay 
So that's where I think we have to go to deal with this disagreement, although obviously it's going to raise other hackles in a bit. And I think it was always there in the background because the reason for deferring to Clark, if there was one, was always that he's a famous art historian, a, a connoisseur, not because he was a master of in, introspection, because obviously we already knew he was a famous art historian. We didn't know, and we can't now be sure that he was a master of introspection. And again, Volheim's authority surely depends in large measure to the fact that he really did know a lot about painting. Now, it also is the case that uh, there's a normal value lurking in real likenesses too. And that appears very obviously, for example, in the further workings of my non-distraction thesis. The thesis was this, remember, that attending to the medium of a representational work can't inevitably be a distraction from attending to its content or vice versa. And I actually define, well, I mean, it's a bit of an offhand definition, maybe to challenge it, but I, I go on to define distraction uh, as follows. Attending to one thing, A, is a distraction from attending to another, B, if and only if attending to A necessarily makes you attend to B less well. Okay, and there's the, there's the, the normal value in there. There's, a, there's an idea of what it would be involved. And I take it the less well means that in some sense you, you miss something of what there is in B. Uh, okay. Now, in the end, the value or norm involved in the idea that what, what, I want, what we're doing with phenomenological, phenomenological descriptions is trying to get a sense of what it is to experience the thing properly or appropriately, I think uh, it derives, or at least is linked with, some such principle of experience as this. And I'm calling it EP for experience principle. Here it is. I, and again, you may... Uh, uh, um, worry about the details of this, but this is a, a shot at, at formulating it. If we're experiencing something in an appropriate way, the character of the experience should reflect the character of the thing the experience is of. And I think uh, that that gives you a bit of, you understand a bit about what's going on. It looks as if this is now this, you can see why phenomenological arguments have a particular kind of role here, particularly in a philosophy of, of this and actually maybe in thinking about uh, works of art altogether. So you can see how phenomenological arguments can now put pressure on our conception of the objects of our experience. You say that this is how this is clearly the right way to experience it, how we're meant to experience it. That puts pressure on what it is that you're experiencing when you're looking at a painting or a photograph or, or, or a novel or reading, reading a novel or whatever. Okay. And conversely, your conception of the objects of your experience, what it is that you're encountering when you look at a painting, a photograph, or read a, a novel, your conception of that will lead you to re-examine the, the, the phenomenology. And I must say, I think it's, it's really clear that that second thing, principle is, uh, is taking a, 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 a strong role in um, Malcolm Budd's um, rebuttal of uh, of Volheim seeing in. <clears throat> so what I suggest is that actually most accounts of the character of our experience of representational art are shaped by a conception of the nature of the objects we encounter there. So we 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 try to re-describe our experience in such a way as to make sense of the conception that we have of the kinds of thing that we must be encountering when we uh, look at the paintings, the photographs, or read the novels. I think this uh, conception of the nature of the things we encounter has hardly been questioned, but once you question it, uh, uh, then you can rethink the character of the experience in a conversing uh, the, the other way. Okay. So I'm not going to talk about just briefly, this is just maybe a slightly clumsy word. I'm going to use the term things we encounter in art to talk about the same sorts of things as I in ND I, I call the content. Okay. So this is the people, the things, the states of affairs that you see in paintings and photographs, the people, things and states of affairs, which in some sense come before our minds, made present for us in some way in novels. Now I'm going to show you three pictures. So they're 
I'm, this talk is sort of about pictures, and I'm focusing on the pictures sides of it. Uh, I showed you one picture to begin with, and another picture at the end, and here are three. Okay, here's the first. It's a picture of a rubber duck, and here's the second. It's a picture of a real duck. This is a mallard duckling for those who are interested in that. Uh, and here is a picture of a Barbie doll and Barbara Handler. Uh, the Barbie doll was uh, introduced, I think, as an import from Germany, but it, the idea of it was introduced into America by Ruth Handler in the 1950s, and uh, the doll was named after her daughter Barbara. And there's a picture of Barbara with the Barbie doll. Okay, so with those three pictures, you can get a sense of contrast, okay? And I'm going to introduce then this slight term of art, a thing called real things of our kinds. Real things is not really helpful, but it's real things of our kinds I want to, to get to. Because the word real is used in various contrasts and almost always in connection with some noun, or in the case of really, uh, some adjective or verb. But here I'm interested in the distinction, as it were, between a rubber duck and a real duck. A rubber duck really exists, is really something, can really float, and so on. But it's not a real duck. Similarly, a Barbie doll really exists, is really something, can really be carried, and so forth. But it, or she, whatever you want to say, isn't a real person. So a rubber duck and a Barbie doll both really exist but they aren't real things of their kinds, a duck, a person, respectively. So the traditional assumption, I think, has been mostly done without question, although it's interesting that uh, Walton is absolutely explicit that he's, he's insisting on this. He thinks I, he clearly thinks it's an advantage of his theory. Uh, uh, it's traditionally assumed, I think, that the things we encounter in representational works the things seen in paintings and photographs, or the things we otherwise encounter in novels, are real things of their kind. It doesn't follow from this, of course, that the real thing of the kind that we encounter really exists. It might be entirely imaginary for them, but the assumption has been that it's a real thing of its kind that we're uh, after, rather than something like a rubber duck or a Barbie doll. And I think it's this assumption which by way of that experiential principle, which says that if you're experiencing it right, uh, the character of the experience should match the uh, character of the thing you're experiencing. Uh, that It's that that forces us into uh, uh, what I think is a phenomenologically unnatural conception of the experience of representational art. So if you think that you're somehow seeing a real person, when you look at a painted portrait, the following seem plausible suggestions about what might seem to be going on. Given that there is no real person there to be seen right in front of you at the time. You might be under an illusion that you're seeing a real person. You might be having some peculiar kind of sui generis visual experience of a real person. You might be being prompted to imagine that you're seeing a real person. Or you might be being reminded of a real person or something like that. And those are certainly pretty clearly among the views to be found. Well, my proposal is uh, that what you encounter in the work of representational art is something like a rubber duck as opposed to a real duck or something like a Barbie doll as opposed to a real person. This is the kind of thing I call a real life. A rubber duck is a real likeness of a real duck, and a Barbie doll is a real likeness of a real person, but neither of them is a real thing of its own kind. So the rubber duck isn't a real duck, and the Barbie doll isn't a real doll. So my suggestion is that when you look at that Rembrandt portrait at the beginning, what you're seeing is it's a painted face. It's a face made of paint, just like a rubber duck is a duck made of rubber, okay? <clears throat> and so, 
uh, I thought then was that something counts as a realizing of a person, for example, if and only if. First of all, it's a kind of unified thing. Uh, it's a it's a sort of thing that has a unity of its own, which, as a whole, resembles a person and is meant to resemble a person. That was my proposal, although other proposals might be available. And what makes it a unified thing, I thought, was that its parts and features are normatively interdependent, that none of them should have been the way they were if it hadn't been appropriate for all of the others to be like that. Okay, they're all, as it were, in place. So then, given that, the challenge was to understand for each representational art form, and here particularly for a picture workshop, uh, painting and photographs, how there might, first of all, be a unified thing of the relevant kind, which secondly, we can encounter in a way that's intelligible as the way we encounter things in works of that art form. For example, in the case of uh, pictures, by looking at them. And thirdly, the experience of which we can plausibly understand to match the kind of experience which it's appropriate to have of things within that art form. So the idea is that uh, the challenge is, is to make sense of what it would be for there to be a unified thing of the right sort, which you can encounter in the relevant works art, of, of art, and then try to understand how supposing that were the thing which was uh, the person you saw in the, uh, the picture or whatever, uh, supposing that were the thing that you have experience of, can you make sense of experience of that kind of thing, uh, a proper experience of that kind of thing, having the character which we think uh, uh, it's appropriate to have of uh, things in that art form. So roughly, does this get the phenomenology right? <clears throat> well, going back to the experience principle which I'm relying on here, that if we're experiencing uh, something in an appropriate way, the character of the experience should reflect the character of the thing th the experience is of. And I, I think we've seen our conception of the character of an appropriate experience can be influenced by a conception of the character of its object, and our conception of the object can be influenced by our conception of an appropriate experience. Now, there's a kind of risk of circularity here. Uh, if, first, there's nothing more to our conception of the character of an appropriate experience of something than is provided by our conception of the character of what it's an experience of, and there's nothing more to our conception of the character of the object of the experience, the thing that the experience is of, than is provided by our conception of the character of an appropriate experience of it. So you don't want that to be a circularity. So I'm going to suggest that we have a little bit of extra focus on the idea of, uh, of what it is that makes an experience of a uh, relevant work of art uh, appropriate. <clears throat> and I think it's natural to think that the way to do that is to, is to, is to get your view of what counts as an appropriate experience of a piece of representational art and therefore of the character of works of representational art themselves, get both sides of them informed by thinking about and with luck understanding representational art, particularly within that art form. So we need to understand both what the artist might be doing that makes sense of in some way of what they are doing, what they do do, and what the viewer or the audience or the reader or whoever might reasonably get from a work that's worth having. And I, I think that, that's why I, I think I said in the abstract that it, it's, it's got to, phenomenological arguments need in the end to be buttressed by what I call critical theory. What I mean is um, by a critical theory is just a theory of this, a theory of, of what the artist is up to and what the viewer, uh, the audience or the reader might reasonably get from a, a work that's worth having. That's the thing, and I think that's what in the end, you need to use to fix without circularity your conception of what counts as an appropriate experience, and uh, at the same time, that is to say, both sides of the experience principle, both the appropriate experience and your conception of the kind of thing um, that uh, that there is to be encountered in engaging with art. My own view, at least my own temptation, is I'm tempted towards what I call an enriched formalism. 
And that takes the business of representational art to be concerned uh, at its core with composition. And uh, it, 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 that's composition in the sense that used, is used in visual art, but generalized across all art forms. And I take composition in that sense to be a matter of arranging the content, the things you encounter, what's to be seen in a painting, in the representational space, which might include most obviously, for example, the, the limits of a painting, the outer boundaries of it, but might also um, do something with uh, other things as well. Um, okay, and that's where I'll stop with the other picture that I used. At this point, I'll try to unshare. There we go. That's it.